Thank you, uh, Sayyid Hadi, and thanks to everyone for the opportunity uh, to be here. Assalamu alaikum. Um, uh, uh, it's always nice to go towards the end. Well, it's, there's good and bad. The bad is everybody's asleep. The good is I can disagree with everybody and they can't have anything back. So everyone who spoke to now is wrong, uh, and let me explain why. Um, I could have done that in 90 seconds. Anyway, um, I'm just kidding. Uh, what I do, though, is a little bit different than, um, uh, than, than at least a few of the approaches so far. I try to look at modern courts and modern courts uh, as they apply Islamic law. Um, and I don't view it as necessarily in conflict with the kinds of things that Asif was talking about or Dr. Kadivar was, uh, was talking about. Um, uh, the point I would make is whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing, just descriptively, descriptively, right now and for the foreseeable time to come, um, uh, 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 Islamic law is very often adjudicated in modern state courts. And what those outcomes are, I think, does affect how Islamic law is understood in those polities. And in fact, has a greater effect on it, I think, than what Western academics you know, think about uh, um, uh, uh, Islamic law. Uh, we fill each other's, you know, law review footnotes uh, 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 with our, each other's sites, but I'm not sure we have the same influence on Islamic law that modern courts do. So I do think it's important to talk about modern courts and how they approach and understand Islamic law, um, not as an exclusive way of understanding what Islamic law is or how it should work, but as, uh, as, as an important subject uh, and area of study. Um, and I'm going to talk today uh, a little bit about that in the context of, um, of apostasy. So just to give a sense of the approach, and I think to sort of move into the presentation, you could answer Jihad's question that was raised a little bit earlier a little more straightforwardly when you think of Islamic laws filtered through state courts. If one were to ask, for example, well, in Iraq, could a woman who wanted to change her mind and convert away from Islam into another religion, uh, would she ber be permitted to do that? And an Iraqi lawyer could give you a very straightforward answer. Right? And we'll, I'll talk about this in, uh, uh, in some detail. Uh, but the answer would be uh, that there would be no criminal punishment, but that it wouldn't be recognized, that she couldn't convert away, that she would be regarded as Muslim for inheritance purposes or for marriage purposes, that she could never marry a Christian, and, and, and that's the way it is. Now, we can talk about Sharia being a discursive tradition. We could talk about different understandings. But that's what the court would say. And the court would call it Islamic, and the court would call upon Islamic sources to do it. That does filter and affect how people understand what Islamic law is when judges continue to say that. And by the way, that's not just Iraq. We were hearing about different, different states that have Islamic law, and we were talking about apostasy and blasphemy. We were talking about places where these things are codified more forthrightly. Uh, Iraq, and the reason I want to talk about Iraq is because I think it's more, uh, 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 is more, uh, is a better example, uh, more representative, in the sense that uh, it is like a, no a large number of other Islamic states that codify or otherwise regard as Islamic, apply as, as Islamic in one form or another, particular issues, but not others. Right? So they don't have Hadood ordinances. Right? The minority of Islamic states have Hadood ordinances. Most states, though, use personal status, for example, and do, not everybody, but do take Islamic personal status seriously. As a result of that, very often what occurs in modern courts, Egyptian courts, Iraqi courts, Malaysian courts, Emirati courts, Kuwaiti courts, right, Syrian courts, is if you were to try to convert away from Islam, nothing would happen in terms of criminal punishment. Right? But you wouldn't be able to, for personal status purposes, you'd be regarded um, as, a, um, as a Muslim. I wanted to walk through a few cases, representative cases, and I really want to do sort of a chronology of Iraqi law to talk about some of the tensions and some of the ways in which that might be breaking down. Right? I don't think we're giving enough credence to the fact that, uh, that there may be more plurality uh, that's evolving in modern court practice uh, with respect to its interpretation of Islamic law uh, than existed in the past. So uh, if we were going to start the Iraqi story, we would start it in the year 2000. Uh, the Malaysians would start a little bit earlier with a famous case called Lena Joy. Um, uh, uh, but in Iraq, you start in the case uh, in 2000. And what normally happens in Iraq and the way that these conversion cases work, uh, they worked differently in the ones I'm going to talk about. They worked a little bit differently in Malaysia. Um, but the way they worked in, in Iraq was uh, you would have cases in which the child was born into a particular religion. So in the 2000 case, the famous 2000 case, the child, uh, the, the, it was a girl. She was born uh, in 1979, and her father converts into Islam in 1989. And she's pulled in with her father and then listed in the civil records as Muslim. 
1989. As soon as she turns 18 in 1997 says, I don't want to be Muslim. I never chose to be Muslim. I would like to be recorded as a Sabian, right? Religious minority mentioned in the Quran, people, the book, etc. And so the, this comes to the court. Right? And the court, uh, uh, and she quotes actually a, 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 a presidential decree, this is a Saddam era presidential decree from 1988, uh, in which Saddam says, well, anybody who wants to do this can do it. If they had an original religion, they can come back to their religion of origin um, within one year of attaining the, the year of majority. But then in 1994, Saddam Hussein found God. He invaded Kuwait. He had problems, so he had found God. And, uh, uh, the sad thing is you all bought it. I mean, not you, but... Uh, anyway, so uh, 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 God is found, and uh, 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 he says, well, uh, another presidential decree comes out, and it says, well, when we said you could convert back, we mean consistent with the rules of the Sharia. You can convert back, to the extent that it's consistent with the rules of the Sharia. So the court says, ah, Sharia. So we have two principles in the Sharia, the court. Number one, once you've converted into Islam, you're not allowed out. Nobody can convert away from Islam. Right? Once you're Muslim, you, you can't convert uh, away from Islam. Now, we've had discussions about that over lunch and before lunch and late. Let me just say this, and I don't think this is controversial. There's a deep pedigree to that. Whether or not it's uncontroversial, whether or not one can understand the classical jurists elsewhere, it's not hard for a court to pick up stuff, to define red death from a classical text, to pick up stuff from a classical text, and to say, you can't convert away. And indeed, uh, the punishment is death. We, uh, me and Arafat, I think we, I'm not sure if we disagree or not. Uh, the way I read Sarahsi, uh, men are put to death for apostasy, but women are uh, imprisoned and, and beaten. They're not, uh, they're not uh, uh, killed. In any event, it's not, it's not much by way of religious freedom. Again, you can contextualize it, right? But that's, that's, that's what the court is drawing upon. The second thing that it draws upon is this idea that if the father, either of the parents convert, the child converts with the parent. And let me say, there's not nearly as much pedigree for that. And what's very interesting is the court deliberately, at first I thought this was just sloppy, but seems to be misquoting its authorities, right? So it starts with... Uh, it starts with uh, uh, Ibn Qudama, uh, where I found it, uh, 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 this, this idea. Uh, it goes on to Sarasi, where I found this idea. And then it says, for the Shia source, it says, Shawa al Islam, for Muhaqqaqan li Hilli, which is just all wrong, I mean, in terms of the, 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 the source description. And then it pulls up as the, as the, as the uh, Shafi'i source, uh, Muhammad al Shawkani, which I don't know who would think he's a Shafi'i. Uh, but in any event, it pulls up all these weird different sources. Um, and I, you, it's not that easy to find in these sources. And indeed, it, it, with respect to the Shi'i sources that it claims to be finding, there's really nothing at all. The Shi'i, the Shi'i position is always to focus on whether or not the, uh, the, the, the child was born Muslim or not. That has important consequences in Shi'i jurisprudence, which continue to last. It's nice to talk about context, but to this day, Shi'i jurists continue, in the world of the nation state, continue to have the same opinion, right? Which is, uh, if you were born Muslim, you can't convert away, and there's no opportunity to repent even. Uh, but if you were not born Muslim and you were trying to turn back to your religion of origin, at that point, you have three days to repent. Again, for men, not for women. For women, they're imprisoned and then beaten during the prayer times. So uh, the, uh, 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 it's not hard to find stuff about apostasy. It's much harder to find stuff about forcing children in. The other issue, of course, that arises is that the child is 10. And within Shia rules, she'd be an adult anyway, right? marry, consummate the marriage, all that. Um, and so, in terms of a contract, et cetera. So, uh, 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 what's interesting is that the court does apply what it calls an apostasy rule, right? But it's not really an apostasy rule. It's not applying any sort of punishment, right? It's merely refusing to recognize something, which you would never do in any other crime, right? In any other crime, you wouldn't say, oh, uh, you're accused of drug trafficking. Oh, no, drug trafficking is illegal. It wouldn't happen in our society. It didn't happen. No, we refuse to recognize it, right? You wouldn't do this in any other case. What they're just doing is refusing to recognize the conversion rather than punishing it in any sort of formal sense. You also have a choice that you're going to somehow apply Iraqi law principles to who is a, a, the age of majority, but Islamic law principles. And you have a choice of whatever the Saddam Hussein was saying in 1994 somehow revoked what was saying in 1988, and it's not necessarily clear. You could have said the great and brilliant Saddam Hussein uh, was merely pointing out that he follows the Sharia, which is obvious because he's great and brilliant, uh, signed court. Um, uh, so there's any number of things that could have been done. One of the things that I think is always interesting and important to point out as you look at some of these cases is the extent to which judicial choice 
is really involved in a lot of this. That is to say, when you say you're going to take a fifth rule that, that, was, that, that, that imagined a very different policy in which nation states didn't exist, and we had Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb, and we had a whole bunch of different things, and you're going to put that and you're going to apply it into a modern court structure, in addition to the issues that Asifa was talking about, about monopolization of law in the nation state, you also have a modern court system and a modern court judge, and you have issues of standing and issues of jurisdiction and issues of, of presidential decrees and the standing of presidential decrees and the relative priority to give to them and to give to elements of Islamic law. And what you see is a series of choices being made. A, ju a court wanting to somehow assert some false sense of piety by preventing this girl from uh, uh, converting uh, backwards. Okay, that's Saddam Hussein's time. Uh, could be the uh, could be the uh, uh, argument. Um, what about what about afterwards when we had a constitution that was actually enacted and uh, and and was taken a little more seriously than than whatever the Ba'ath uh, wrote as a constitution? Um, interestingly, when the constitution was drafted, a lot of people focused on the repugnancy clause. You know, no law may violate settled rulings of Islam. What's more interesting and was very heavily debated, but slipped past. Big surprise, the American Embassy, um, not quite attuned to the issues of Islamic law, was Article 2, Section 2. Because the Section 2 says Islam, uh, the state has the obligation to protect the Islamic identity of the majority of the population, but also re respects the religious rights of all individuals, including blah, 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 blah. Right? The only people who really picked this up were the secular Kurds. They immediately picked this up and said, we know what you're going to do with that respect the majority. You are attempting in some way or other to make the state the protector of Islamic identity and include, right, it's specifically said in the, in the, in the, in the negotiation meetings, um, I uh, had some very outside role in it. Most importantly, I have a book on it, which you can find on Amazon uh, and, uh, and, 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 and buy. I get royalties, so. Um, but I'll, I'll buy you a coffee or something. Um, so, uh, what's interesting is that the Kurds immediately picked this up, but of course this was vigorously denied. But ultimately, ultimately what was interesting was when the same case came up, this time a 15-year-old Christian whose father converted into Islam, right, and this was in 2008, right, the Court of Cassation said, no, we have existing precedent, you're not allowed to convert away, and we have to protect the Islamic identity and the existing precedent. The, thing, the interesting thing about the existing precedent is you're not in a, again, it's all about choice. You're not in a society where, where a court of cassation is required to follow a previous court. Second of all, the whole basis for following was a 1995 Saddam presidential decree, right? So the new court, of course, wouldn't say, well, we're following what Saddam Hussein told us to do in 2008, right? But they said we're following what the old court told us to do and just sort of ignore the original sort of uh, interpretation and understanding, and went with a constitutional provision that says protect the majority of the Islamic population. But again, that's a choice, because you also have other sections of the Constitution that says to each individual is the right of freedom and conscience. And nowhere does it say, because you couldn't possibly say, right, in a, in, in, at least in, Iraq, in the Iraqi context, uh, except for apostasy. Right? It's just unthinkable. It just wouldn't pass. There's too much too much global condemnation, too much uh, American influence, et cetera. So, so all of it was sort of coded. And the court sort of took the code, right? And so you have the same rule now, right? Um, and you have the same tradition being applied that is applied, as I said, in courts around the world. So jihad's question, in many ways, is very easy to answer when you think about Islamic law at the state court level at most states, right? You cannot. I mean, nothing's going to happen to you criminally. But, but you're stuck. You're stuck. Whether that's good or bad, I, as I said, it sort of has an influence. Last case I do want to discuss. Um, is, uh, is, is, is an interesting one because it's the, uh, the Kurdish court of, uh, of Cassation. This uh, was a case that was decided in the independent Kurdish region of, uh, of uh, Iraq in 2004. Same issue, right? It was, a, 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 although, although the child was only six in this case, it was a, a, I believe it was a boy. And the mother converts to, uh, um, to Islam in 1992, the mother, right? Um, converts in 1992, um, and the the daughter, I guess, raises it in 2004. Uh, it's a son, excuse me, uh, raises it in 2004 and says, "Well, I need to convert back to the religion of my parents." And again, this is challenged. Right? Uh, the uh, the civil service doesn't want to change the designation, and the court actually does allow it this time. They do allow the change of religion in the Kurdish region of Iraq, and so that's now the going rule there. Right? So I, I mean, uh, 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 if we're talking about evolution and sort of, of changes, the court says three very interesting things, or bases it on three very interesting points, which I think are worthy of thinking about. The first of them, 
The first of them is a fiqhi sort of interpretation. It said, well, look, the reality is that when the mother converted and the child was only six, she lived in Mosul and the child lived in the Kurdish region. Right? And in 1992, it was such that they were effectively divided. Right? The, 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 the reunification of Iraq uh, occurs in 2003 with the American uh, invasion. Uh, but in, from 1990 to 2003, you couldn't really go. They were, two, they were basically two separate states. They were cut off from each other. So the child had no real relationship with the mother upon interning. Cited a series of sources right, from Shafi'i sources primarily that said, you know, if the father disappears, Right, and sort of goes to the house of Islam, someone's in the house of war, then you don't really consider the child having brought, been brought in, even though under normal cases you would be. I think it was a Hanafi interpretation. Um, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, Shafi interpretation. In any event, you had a, you had a, a, a series of sort of uh, uh, fiqh uh, interpretations as to what happens in the unique situation where the parent doesn't have a relationship with the child. And actually they cited Obama is a good example of, you know, here's proof. Uh, what else do you want? Um, okay, great. Um, the second thing that the court said was, well, we have an interim constitution. The interim constitution guarantees freedom of religion. As I said, the, the central court could have gone that way too, right? Uh, but it didn't. It chose not to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, go that way. You could read the constitution that way. But the constitution both enshrines the several rulings of Islam and the protection of the majority, as well as grants freedom of religion and conscience, and that becomes ultimately a balance, and, uh, and, and they balance it the other way. The final thing that the court said, which was interesting, said, well, aside from all of that, we have a Quranic versus Islamic al-Din, and we have an understanding now of apostasy as a political crime, something that's, uh, that I think uh, uh, Asma had said earlier, um, that uh, uh, the, the views of apostasy as a, a political crime, and then cites the Iraqi born has educated uh, Jabr al-Awani, Taha Jabr al-Awani, for this, uh, for this uh, 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 proposition. Doesn't really cite to a page, just sort of, sort of throws, it, uh, throws it out there. Um, I found it interesting, a couple things I could say about this case that I found interesting. The two, the two, real, the two real interesting points that I, that I found interesting was that the court was both willing, right, both willing to, uh, uh, to raise this alternative, but didn't want to rely on it exclusively. That is to say, it could have omitted it, and just gone with the, 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 the more classic fiqh sort of the mother was separated from the child. Right? Or it could have just said, forget it. We're going to do a new interpretation. But it wanted to balance it, right? We have a bunch of reasons, but here's one of them. Right? Just to at least raise that possibility of an alternative interpretation. I do think it's important when courts start to do these sorts of things. This kind of evolution that we've seen among some scholars uh, gains head. Second is, I wonder if there's some sectarian element to this. Uh, Alwani is, is obviously uh, a Sunni. Uh, it would be a much harder thing for an Iraqi court to be able to try to address this because the Iraqi court would sort of then have to quote a Shia scholar. And of course, they could maybe quote our own Dr. Mavani here or Abdulaziz Sajidina, but um, Sajidina already has a fatwa issued against him, and I'm sure Dr. Mavani doesn't want a fatwa against him from Sistani. So the point is, they're, they're, not, they're not figures that are going to be respected within Nejef. Within Nejef, it's a pretty clear consensus that, uh, that you can't convert. So, this, 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 so, so, so you're not going to have that, that opportunity. So what's the takeaway from all this now that I have about a minute left? Um, what's the takeaway from all this? There's a few things that I did want to point out. One, well, three real points. One, I think the traditional views of what apostasy is hold a lot of sway, whether you want to call them traditional or not traditional. But the view that has some fiqh pedigree to it, this idea that you shouldn't be able to convert away, we, won't, we will not recognize that conversion, has significant heft to it. Iraq is an example of this. But as I said, these cases have arisen in other jurisdictions, and that's how they tend to come out. Right? At the same time, I think you're seeing a little bit of a crumbling. I could have pointed to a Tunisian case as well, as well as the Kurdish one. Right? At the edges. Right? But these ideas that have come from people like Hashim uh, Kamali and, 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 uh, and uh, Taha al-Alwani have, have, have started to penetrate. Not deep necessarily, but they're there. Right? And you can see change, I think, happening a little bit. Um, and then the other thing I did want to point out is I think it's very hard to eliminate the possibility, the, the issues of sectarianism that, are, that, that, uh, that continue to affect uh, uh, court understandings um, and, uh, and uh, uh, court practices. In connection with that, let me just say, as a Shia, a lot of Sunnis are always saying, well, we have crisis of authority. We just don't have the authorities. If we had the authorities, let me say, authority works well sometimes and works not so well other times, right? So when you have ISIS, it's nice to have a Sistani, right? They're crazy, and then you've got a whole bunch of people saying, yep, no, we agree they're crazy, right? And then they're sort of outside the mainstream. But when you're trying to move the doctrine to something different from what it was in the classical period, and you have a bunch of modern jurists saying, no, 
no istibab, uh, no, no, no opportunity for repentance, right? And, uh, and uh, if you were born Muslim, uh, if you were born Muslim, and, uh, and these, are the, these are the punishments. It's very hard then to try to say, well, let's try to contextualize, let's try to understand, because you are talking about modern jurists and you're sort of standing in their face. Um, and it becomes harder to move the doctrine, let's just say, more liberally. So you can control it, but there's, but there's definitely disadvantages to the process as well. Oh, anyway, that's all I had, um, and uh, uh, I look forward to questions.